Dr. Paul Gottfried, why are most people oblivious to the problems of political correctness and ideological manipulation? Well, I think there's several answers to this. <clears throat> I think in most cases, they, they, certainly most people that I meet, um, even if they do not believe in the premises of political correctness, which are taught in public uh, uh, education, which they will pick up certainly from the media, from the entertainment industry, are very much focused on their own lives, getting ahead, making money for people my age, visiting their children and grandchildren. And what, um, uh, what may affect the society ideologically doesn't really matter. Most people are non-ideological. They're oblivious to what is going on unless they get thrown in prison or are denied uh, minimal subsistence level uh, advantages. <clears throat> um, uh, among um, groups, though, that are politically aware, there are many people who are given uh, victim status, uh, although there's obviously a hierarchy of victims. Um, obviously, if you're gay or black or whatever, there's certain groups that are, that are featured as victims. They're more prominent in the media. Uh, their, their suffering, their exposure to bigotry are much, going to be much more emphasized. But let's say even if you're a woman looking for a job, you know that there are laws which prevent discrimination against you, which are being supported by both major political parties and by candidates for public office. Um, <clears throat> if women are depicted as a victim group, um, this gives you a leg up in terms of finding a position. So there are lots of groups that benefit in one way or another um, by the emphasis on victimhood um, and the teaching of political correctness. <clears throat> um, finally, I, I would say that this uh, diversity or multicultural ideology with its attendant hierarchy of victims and victimizers um, is the post-Christian religion of the West. Um, it is taught everywhere, inside and outside of churches, um, and to the extent that people do have religious moral beliefs, uh, they reflect political correctness. This is my experience. Now, it's not that everybody is running to, uh, uh, to give their houses to minorities uh, or to make sure that their ch white children marry blacks or Hispanics in order to show how liberal they are. Um, but to the extent that people are seen as moral, decent, nice, and sensitive, they are supposed to believe in multiculturalism um, and supposed to recognize that there are certain historic victims and the others are supposed to make amends to them through social policy, economic redistribution. Why have you been so critical of the conservative movement? <clears throat> well, I, I, I think the conservative movement has been complicit in all of this. Uh, right now, you have uh, an election in New York in which the neoconservative press, which has become the establishment conservative press, is backing a liberal Democrat who uh, is seen at gay prides with his daughter, Andrew Cuomo, uh, against an Italian Catholic candidate who dared to suggest that homosexuality is not an acceptable lifestyle. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the conservative movement is always very happy to be reconciled with social liberals um, as long as it can get its way on other issues, for instance, foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East, um, and certain kinds of economic changes, economic policy changes that benefit corporations that give money to conservatives or conser movement conservative politicians. They do not represent any kind of establishment uh, challenge, um, and they're much more concerned with maintaining friendship within the policy community or the media community of which they are an integral part than they are with standing up for traditional social positions. Do you see any solution to the problem? Do I see any solution to this problem? <clears throat> yes, I think if problems become much more acute, that is to say, if government uh, favors in some very um, discriminatory or gross fashion certain groups at the expense of others, there's going to be at least an outcry. I think the Democratic Party is sitting on a volcano, by the way. I think that the victim groups that line up with the Democrats 
uh, have competing, are making competing demands, blacks and Hispanics, uh, Jews and blacks and so forth. I don't think these are compatible groups in the end. Uh, so I see tensions within the political system that are going to arise out of competing claimants for favors and victim, victim status. Uh, that, that I see is one source of conflict that is going to continue and probably become more acute in the future. Um, an, another, uh, another thing is I think more and more people are becoming aware of the fact that they're being manipulated, even if they do allow themselves to be manipulated. I think at some level there is popular unhappiness with this. Um, you saw this in Connecticut, which is probably the most liberal state in the Union, in Stefano versus Ritchie case, when you had um, an Irish-Italian uh, firefighting force be, um, complaining they would be denied promotion because it was being given to blacks who scored lower on, um, <clears throat> on occupational tests. Um, in my opinion, actually, the uh, Sotomayor and the others who found, uh, found it for the minorities were probably interpreting the Civil Rights uh, Act accurately. <clears throat> but the, uh, the other side argued on the basis of the, of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, their rights were being denied. Now, this has not created enough of a stir to change the political climate in Connecticut, and I suspect the Italians and the Irish are going to continue to vote for liberal Democrats as opposed to liberal Republicans because of the choices you have in Connecticut. Um, but I think the, the level of discontent has gone up somewhat, not enough to change the system, uh, but certainly to create tensions within the system. You mentioned a, a level of discontent. Mm -hmm. Is there a point of no return on this? Is there a point where we're just, we've gone too far? Well, <clears throat> I don't know whether we've gone too far, but looking at European countries, they have gone too far. Um, I see no way that Germany is ever going to return. Um, despite years of, well, perhaps because of years of political indoctrination in which Germans told that they're, uh, they're subhuman, that they've started every war in human history, and they could only atone for this by handing over their country to Muslim immigrants uh, and by allowing themselves to be merged with the European Union, um, their country has ceased to be a nation state. I don't know what it is. It's simply waiting. It's a collection of yuppies and uh, welfare state beneficiaries waiting to be taken over by the EU, uh, producing very few offspring, um, and being colonized by Muslims. Um, I, I think there are other countries in Europe, like Spain, which uh, present an almost equally bleak, you know, uh, future for a multicultural country. I don't think we're quite at that point, but I'm not, I'm not sure these European countries can come back from where they are. Well, I think what, what much of Western Europe is ruined irretrievably, irreversibly ruined by the amount of multicultural indoctrination and the application of multicultural policies through which they have, um, through which they have passed in, in recent decades. Now, if I could play devil's advocate, right. uh, what would you say to someone that says, for example, you may say that Europe is, is unfixable, but mm -hmm. at the same point, we haven't seen any major wars in Europe like World War I and World War II since for 50 years. Yeah. You'd be unlikely to see any major wars in Europe in the last 50 or 60 years because they bled themselves white in two world wars. Okay. The, um, there, there's no reason to assume they would be going to war with each other if it were not for the European Union. Um, what they basically have done is turned their cities um, into centers of civil strife because of the, the presence of large Muslim populations that they cannot integrate into their societies. But the, uh, the notion that somehow they'd all be killing each other were it not for the European Union or not for their weakened national sense and the triumph of multiculturalism in Europe, um, I, don't think is, um, uh, I don't think is a particularly sound um, uh, refutation of my, of my position. Uh, I don't think there were any wars in the cards. The, the, the major problem, of course, was the polarization between the United States and the Soviet Union, in which the battlefield was likely to be Europe. But Europe was playing a very minor role. <clears throat> Moreover, in the 1950s, there was a much stronger sense of nationhood in Europe than there is now. You know, and they were not going to war. I mean, Germans still had a sense of being German. The French under de Gaulle had a sense of being French. Spain was ruled by a very reactionary leader, Franco. Um, but Europeans still had a profound sense of national identity back in the 1950s. 
uh, even you know, and they're willing to, but they were willing to cooperate. They create the coal iron community. They they even signed the Treaty of Rome, which may have been the slippery slope leading to the European Union. But you you did you did see European countries that both had a, had a sense of themselves as nations, um, and, and yet they, they were willing to to cooperate. And there was no likelihood of European countries going to war. There are many groups that benefit, but they benefit differentially. That is to say, you know, blacks certainly benefit, or certain blacks. Not all blacks benefit. Certain blacks benefit. Uh, uh, not the black underclass. They get nothing out of this. Um, but the black middle class women um, who are given uh, privileged access to positions, black women in particular, um, some Hispanics, although not all Hispanics, benefit from this. Uh, but in a, in a more general way, certain groups derive. But for instance, Hispanics derive benefit, A, because people cannot come out against immigration because they feel uh, that this would, you know, this would uh, uh, brand them as racist or bigots. Uh, so all the Republican candidates are now running saying, we want legal immigration, we want more immigration. This, this, is, this is their position now. Um, except for Tam Tancredo in Colorado, who says he does not want more immigration. But this makes him stand out. And even on Fox News, um, he is characterized as a maverick and an exception. So I, I, th I think the Hispanics do benefit in terms of the general immigration situation from this. Um, <clears throat> other groups get a kind of emotional benefit, Jews, for instance, because they're treated as victims of white Christian civilization. Um, and uh, they're allowed to say things about other people that other people can't say about Jews. Uh, the Irish a little bit, little more. Italians, actually, I think, in New York City school system um, are treated as a privileged minority. I think it's City University of New York. They've made it all the way up to victim or semi-victim status. So, I mean, the other ones can always hope that they will rise in the victim hierarchy. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I would say that's probably the bl black middle-class women are right now the major beneficiaries of the spoil system. What would you say to the guy that says, all of this deep thought and all of this intellectual process mm -hmm. is really just a cover for deep-seated racism. Well, <clears throat> I, I, that, that, that wouldn't um, have any effect on, on my thinking. I mean, let, let, let us assume this person is right. Let us say that everyone who is doing this uh, in his heart, his, her, its heart of hearts is an extreme racist. What I'm looking at is the action and the effect of the actions, right? Uh, of course, what part of what drives the system is the sense of sin. I mean, I don't think it's simply technological development or, you know, the, because of the economy. We think, we think in terms of being part of a single. I, I think the, the, the white male Western Christian is made to feel guilty. It's almost, as I said, it's a kind of replacement Christian theology. You're made to feel, and no matter how you search your heart, no matter what good you do, you remain depraved. You're in a state of original sin. I mean, I hear this all the time. Um, but I think what the psychology leads to is a willingness to do even more, you know, to have something uh, similar to what my colleague Trifkovich described as, you know, is going on in Europe, uh, or uh, Derek Turner said is going on in England that we're going to have to push people around even more in order to root out the remnants of racism. How has H.L. Mencken affected your life? <clears throat> well, I don't, I, he has not affected my life recently. He affected me as a very young man about 50 years ago. <clears throat> and uh, I read him, uh, and I really liked his pose, and I liked his Nietzscheanism. Um, because even then, I despised egalitarianism, to be, be perfectly honest about the matter. Um, and I enjoyed the way he poked holes, you know, in uh, the illusions of self-important people. Uh, there were things that he wrote that I, I thought were, you know, going overboard. For instance, attacks on these Southerners. Uh, you know, they become a punch. A bit, even then, they had become punching bags. Um, but I, I liked his, his anti-egalitarianism. I also like his guts for opposing America's entry into World War I. He was perfectly right on, the, on that point, uh, something which the neoconservatives have recently been attacking him. Um, and he was not a personally bigoted man, 
but he never held back from making, um, which say, edgy remarks about groups. Remember his famous remark about who is an anti-Semite, a person who hates Jews more than his, or dislikes Jews more than is absolutely necessary. It was a very, very clever remark. Um, and uh, uh, he was once, you know, describing some dinner companion who was a German Jewish banker. My own family of German Jewish bankers, but they, he said this person had horrible eating habits. He chewed his food too loudly. I thought that was a diary. That was a very amusing remark. Um, and it's very, very uninhibited about, about, you know, saying these things. He is not a vicious person at all, uh, but he was in no way controlled by the um, touchstones of political correctness by which our lives are now being organized or supposed to be organized. Mm-hmm.